Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll begin in just a moment as there are still a few more people logging in, and I want to give everybody a chance to get settled. Thank you. Carisoft would like to welcome you to our webinar, Integration with User Behavior Analytics. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We hope you'll ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. If for some reason we don't get to your question, the SailPoint team here at Carisoft will follow up with you afterwards offline. Carisoft Technology is a trusted government IT solutions provider delivering software and support solutions to federal, state, and local agencies. Carisoft maintains dedicated teams to support sales and marketing for all of its vendors, including SailPoint. Our contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation, and a copy of the webinar will be emailed to you. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Matt Volo, Identity Architect at UberEther, and Matt Topper, President and Solutions Catalyst at UberEther. Matt, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Um, so two maths today. Um, <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone for joining us for user behavior analytics. Um, this is honestly one of the most exciting topics between the identity and access management world um, and um, really the security operations world um, that we've had in a very long time, especially with a lot of the focus on zero trust. So Matt, if you wanna go ahead and just hit next slide. Um, again, UberEther, um, we've been uh, 10 plus years now developing identity and access management solutions across the federal government and commercial world, and um, actually won the Exabeam Partner of the Year Award last year for some of the user behavior analytics we did, um, and have seen just incredible results with customers. So uh, go ahead, Matt, to the next, and then uh, myself. Uh, 20 plus years of doing this in uh, ICAM and federal security solutions and um, tons of customer implementations. You guys have heard this all before. So go ahead and hit the next map. So just real quick on what is user behavior analytics before I turn it over to Matt. Um, inside of identity, we have this really great, we're really able to see the business side of humans and identities and how they interact with our organizations. But as soon as we give them access to resources and they start going to the application, start going to um, get data, we lose complete visibility as to what they do with it and how they're using it, if they're using it. We can do role management all day long based on what people have access to and what they've been given access to. But as soon as we give it to them, we don't know if they actually use it. So user behavior analytics allows us to sit on top of our existing investments in SIM tools like Splunk, like ArcSight, like QRadar, and bring that together into a data lake and say, hey, how does this person behave? What do they, what's their previous history personally? And if they're new to our organization, compare them against their peers. Um, so really, we can start seeing over time if people start laterally moving or hitting services they've never hit before, um, right? We can start increasing these risk scores or coming back and saying, hey, this person normally shows up at 8 a.m. They started showing up at 6 a.m. 
and started hitting sites they don't normally hit. And by the way, because we can see from the identity side, they've also turned in their resignation or they're on a contract that's expiring in the next 30 days. So Matt will go ahead today and kind of walk through some of the different use cases and needs we've built out with user behavior analytics and um, how we can really build a full 360 degree picture, not only of people coming on board, joining our organizations, granting them access, but bringing that back into enforcing access policies, making them up level um, if we see bad behavior going on. And if we have to hit what I've called way too many times the cyber kill switch of, hey, we see enough bad behavior here. The system itself is actually just gonna call over to SailPoint, disable their AD account, disable their VPN and call over to their access management system and kill their in-browser sessions so that we can mitigate that threat until we can go through and hunt and figure out what's going on if this is an actual problem or, hey, nope, false alarm, we'll turn it back on, tweak our behaviors, um, but at least they didn't laterally move across the network. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Volo. Thanks, Matt. So um, in order to understand some of the values of the context that we're gonna be providing to the UAB, UABA products, as well as the context that it can provide back to SailPoint, we're gonna spend a little bit of time just kind of digging into the UABA products and how they actually analyze some of that behavior and establish risk. So one of the uh, key benefits of UABA products is it takes that existing SIM data, analyzes it that you already have in your enterprise, can look at that historical data that you've already established in your SIM and, be, and build a behavior baseline for each of your users. So in order to establish that baseline, it needs to start identifying when a user's activity starts and ends and, and kind of aggregates that as a session and then builds a series of sessions per identity to establish what a person typically does with the access that they've been granted and then compares that day over day or session over session to establish is, are they staying within these bounds or are they kind of uh, exploring new ways to use their access? So as those sessions stay consistent between one another, they create an anomaly factor and that anomaly factor is a multiplier against risk. So if the behavior is similar across those sessions, the anomaly factor pushes down to zero, which becomes a multiplier of zero against a, a fixed risk score. And that's how we lower your risk score over time. And if your behavior changes across those sessions, the anomaly factor will increase and push up your risk score. So if we have somebody that logs in at seven o'clock every single day, that first login, it's a, they've never seen the login before, the anomaly factor will be higher. But as the pattern of day over day of you logging in at 7 a.m. Um, happens, that anomaly factor decreases, the risk decreases of that event. So if you log in at seven every day, eventually that, and that provides no risk. But if you on say a week later, log in at nine o'clock, that's probably okay, but it might not have seen that before. So it might increase your risk a little bit. And then it'll start looking at the activities that you do after you log in and compare those to your baseline. So if we take a team, for example, of logging in at seven o'clock every day, risk goes down. If then we see a login at two o'clock, that or 2 a.m., like in the middle of the night, that would drastically increase the risk, especially if we've never seen that login time before. Now we start might start looking at what the user is actually doing. Maybe at the 2 a.m., they're using three times the bandwidth that they've typically used before. That's also a higher risk. Maybe they're ex-filling data out. But this could also be a production outage where they're working on a break fix. We can start looking at their peers. Their entire team is logged in at 2 a.m. Is that normal? Do they always, always log in together? Are they all working actively on the system? We don't want the UABA product to kill a production break fix, but we also don't want a core cohort of malicious actors exfilling a bunch of data. So that's the type of information that the UABA product is trying to investigate to make accurate decisions when looking at risk. So we talked about how the UABA product works as far as um, connecting with the SIM. And we know how the SIM can look at access from the users, um, but we haven't really started talking about the integration points of how these things will start to work together. So from the sale point perspective, we have a lot of information about the business policy, how the access is provisioned, who approved it, what access anybody has at any point in time, 
And then if we look over at the SIM side, they just have the logs of all the access that's being used. And then UABA product in the middle um, can start to take all of that SIM usage data, flip it into be to be identity centric, and then that information would be useful to SailPoint. Um, so on the SIM side right now, all the SOC analysts have to go through server by server. This person logged into this server and then they logged into the server. Oops, that's another log that I need to open up and see what they did on this server. In the UA, UABA product, you have that timeline of events. So you can see this person SSH into this box and then SSH into this box. It's all visible in one long timeline and that provides the value to the SOC analyst. If we look at the contextual events that would be beneficial to each of the different participants in here, from the sale point side, we have a lot of business awareness uh, as far as what a user or contractor is experiencing within the business. We know when people come and join the company, we know when people are leaving, we know in anticipation of somebody leaving. So if somebody is being offboarded because they turned in their notice in two weeks, those are people we might wanna look at a little bit more closely because they're more likely to exfil data. Similarly with contracts, if they're on their last contract and it's expiring in a week, let's go ahead and elevate that information to our SOC analysts so that they can watch that person a little bit closer because they're about to take all their code to their next contract to jumpstart them ahead for the next project. That all of this context that we have inside of SailPoint is not available to the SIM. On the SIM side, they're just looking at a bunch of alerts waiting for a user to do action that's within a, above a threshold that fires their alert and just floods them with a bunch of things to look at without all this information that we have on the SailPoint side. On the SOC analyst side, from the SIM, they know who's logging in, how the access is being used, who's locked out of their accounts. And all of that information would be very useful to SailPoint. We're provisioning access, but we have no idea who's actually using that access. If we're trying to maintain least privilege, shouldn't we know which access isn't being used or which um, access, when things like failed logins start happening, that could be a spray attack that's coming in that we would have no awareness um, from the SOC side, because you just see a bunch of one-off hits, but in the UEBA product, you could see fail logins across 20 users. So we've talked about how the different products kind of benefit. Let's talk about the different people. So from the SOC analyst perspective, right now they operate on playbooks that are very generic. This alert happened, follow this SOP, take this SOAR action. Those SOAR actions are all bash scripts that do provisioning actions against accounts. On the sale point side, we have mature solutions that are made to connect to those accounts and manage those um, applications. Why don't we have the SOC analysts actually interfacing with sale point to take these actions instead of relying on these one-off scripts? Not to mention it also forces the identity analyst to code for a second input to those applications. We have to do targeted aggregations on those actual users every time we want to do an action just in case a SOC analyst ran a SOAR action that manipulated the user. We're also, um, by incorporating UBA into the sale point decision-making, we can reduce some of those false positives to the SOC analyst because we can, we can provide context that gives them awareness of why some things might be happening. That context could reduce the thresholds that trigger some of these alerts. For the managers, with the UABA product, we can start giving the managers awareness of the access that's actually being used by the direct reports. Instead of just approving the access and it being a black hole of, are my subordinates actually using the access appropriately? We can elevate the information to the managers. If somebody starts using the access a little bit of above a threshold, we can send the manager an email, say, hey, look at this UABA dashboard. Look what your direct report is doing. Is this consistent with your expectations? Um, and then as far as the certifications piece of it go, currently managers are kind of overwhelmed with certifications. Quarterly, they get a certification for their 10 direct reports. They might have 10 roles each. So now they got hundred items to certify. We all know what those managers do. They find the select all button, hit bulk approve. Now the certification is complete and our agency is compliant and secure, right? Um, if we start incorporating some of that UABA information into our certifications, we know these users aren't using these access. We can recommend it, the removal of that access. These users are using their access within normal bounds. We should probably just go ahead and approve this certification and remove it from the view. 
And then we can also say these users are not using their certification or their access within the bounds. And then in the certification, recommended either be investigating, here's a link to the UABA, removed. And once we start uh, down selecting the information that the managers need to look at, we drastically increase the quality of these certifications that we're creating. From the identity analyst, I hit on the SOAR piece of this where we can provide those mature custom solutions to the SOAR actions. But the other part of this is once we have awareness of how the users are using the access, we're not gonna have direct logs of the access, this access was used in this way, but by providing it through risk scores back to the identity products, we can start making, adding additional business policies that react to that risk. As the risk increase, we might do a notification, we might do a certification, we might actually cut the access. We might even get up to that cyber kill switch that Matt had mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about the architectures that we're starting to see at some of the locations that we're working. So this is typical, what we're seeing at most organizations. We have the identity products on the left, sale points in this little governance box on the bottom left here. And we have our IAM system. We have all of the SaaS and on-prem applications in the middle. Most of them are managed, not always. And then on the right, we have the SIM, which is just receiving all the access usage. So right now we have all of this identity data that would be useful flowing away from SailPoint. So we take the access approvals to these applications, then the usage all the way down on the right. How can we start to bring some of that back? If we incorporate the UABA products, which connect directly to the SIM, all of those logs that are there and start aggregating that data up. Now we take that log data, make it identity centric, and then now start preventing or providing this to the SOC analyst. Now they have a way to see actual users, how they're moving across the system. We can provide watch lists to specific users. We'll get a little bit more into what watch lists are coming up forward, but this just gives the SOC analyst immediate benefit to just by just adding a product to the architecture. But if we want to start getting a little bit more of the into the integration with SailPoint, we can start providing some of that user context directly into the UABA product. So over a REST API, we can start sending um, different things about users. We can send who are executives, who are uh, who, which users are contractors on their removing contract, which users are privileged users, um, which users are peers of one another, they share a common manager. Once we start sending all of this additional context to the UABA product, it can start incorporating those into its logic that analysis, that analysis is risk. So once that additional information is available that's not in the SIM, the risk becomes a little bit more um, usable by the identity product because it starts incorporating that risk. And that's why the SIM can start using these, this context information for their SOPs. Adding the next step of this is to start bringing that UABA data into SailPoint. So here is where I was talking about um, using that information to start um, providing certifications with trimmed down selections. We can start having that access awareness or access usage into our certifications because we are receiving the information about how a user is using their risk or using their access. Then once we have that information into SailPoint, both the access usage and the risk scores from the UVA product, we can start making determinations on how we want to manipulate access as or, or respond to that risk. This is where we have the notifications go out, where we create the certifications, where we reach out to those direct managed applications and start taking action directly on those applications. Taking a step further, not only do we need to reach out to those applications, but the, once we disable those applications, the thing that would still be alive would be the active user sessions, both in the PAM systems and the, the access management systems. From, as SailPoint, we can also reach out to those SSO products, those PAM clients, and kill the active sessions. So not only are we disabling their access to the applications, we disable their, their access from the external networks. This is that cyber kill switch that Matt was referring to at the beginning. Going into one other architecture that we've kind of seen at some of our customers that I wanted to bring up is instead of bringing this data directly into SailPoint, we've also seen it centralized into our directories. The advantage here is from a SailPoint side, we still have access to all the same data. We're just centralizing it in the directory. 
But the advantage here is we can, inside of the directory, we can represent this uh, behavior data or risks as group membership, which is very ad advantageous to our access management systems because we could have a group that says, if your risk score is above this threshold, you get represented as a member of this group. And on our AM side, we could say anybody who's a member of this group has to be elevated to multi-factor authentication when they log in. So this is how we get dynamic uh, authentication assurance just by incorporating UAVA and our directory services products. If we and want to- Matt, I was gonna say, I'll just add real quick to that. Um, similarly, not only user identities, but because uh, the user behavior tools are looking across all the services in your organization, if you have IP addresses that um, if you've got people attacking you, right, DOSing you, trying to do um, brute force attacks um, coming from specific IPs, say on your VPN, that gets added to the watch list as a member within your directory services. So even though your VPN has blocked that now, your access management tool also can see that as part that IP address as part of the group membership. And if they pivot and try and go against your single sign-on interfaces for your organization, that's already been blocked. And you can build rules within your UB, UEBA tool that says, hey, we blocked this IP, we're gonna take it off, or hey, they haven't had any more requests in two days, we can automatically take it off. So it dynamically can manage those things for you as well, which um, shows a lot of value beyond just the human identity side to centralize that. Yep, thanks. So jumping into just the last thing we want to talk about before we wrap up is what we've built so far as far as our SailPoint integration. So we have a plugin, installs as a plugin. Um, if you're familiar with plugins, it's just as simple as dragging and dropping it onto the interface and the appropriate XML objects automatically get imported. Um, and the first thing that we manage are watch lists. So out of the box, watch lists in the products we've worked with, uh, they're either static, meaning that you have to manually create and remove the actual watch lists themselves and then managing the users inside of them is very similar. You're directly picking the users you want represented in these watch lists. And then there's usually a couple dynamic ones, um, whether it's going to be related to your risk score being elevated. So you show up on this risk, you show up in this watch list or you're, you have a privileged account or you're a service account. So you get put into this watch list, but we're down to a very small set of attributes that kind of drive watch list membership. So wouldn't it be nice is if instead we had dynamic watch lists that relied on user context to establish membership. So that's what the, that was the first thing that we kind of tackled in SailPoint. But in order to facilitate it, that we needed a way to select and query users inside of SailPoint and build that query. And instead of building an entire SQL interface where we're gonna build a query and make it very technical, instead SailPoint already provides this advanced analytics tool that allows you to kind of build that query in a UI format that's easy to understand. So using the out of the box functionality, you build your query up uh, in advanced analytics. And then after you run the search, um, it'll give you the results. You save that search as a report, and then you go into our custom workflow off of a quick link on the side, and you start to configure your dynamic watch list. So you give it a name, you pick the report query that you saved, and then you pick a schedule at which you would like it to be synchronized with um, the UEBA product. So from this point, what's going to happen is any watch list that is new will get added to the watch list interface in the UEBA product. Any watch list that's removed from this configuration would get dropped. And then any users that get added or removed to those, to those queries are dynamically managed inside of the UEBA product. So if we wanted to create a watch list that said, give me all the people that have an offboarding date or give me all the people that are on contracts that are about to expire, as those users were added to those different workflows that gave them those attributes about either expiring soon or being terminated, they'd be added to those watch lists. And then once they're terminated, they'd be removed. So it kind of gives the SOC analyst that dynamic awareness of what's happening to those users. So here we have a UE SES. So these are the SES users that are being monitored. And then we would see that in the product, we'd have these watch lists that have the SESs dynamically managed here. If we start talking about risk in the product, uh, you're given this timeline and this shows uh, each of these points here are sessions and they give the different risk scores per session. So it's a little hard to read with the gray, but 
On the left, we have a risk score of zero for a session, and then we have about 40 and then up to 120. So as we see, as these sessions occur, there's different risks per session. And then we see at the end, of course, it goes down to zero. So we can, um, inside of SailPoint, we wanted to tackle, as these sessions occurred, responses to these risks. So instead of relying on the SOC analyst to actually take action, we wanted to automate that action in SailPoint. So we can aggregate that as that risk and configure risk actions to respond to that risk. So uh, we built another custom workflow here and with a pre-selection of different risk actions. So we have, if you can see in the dropdown, we have a way to notify uh, any particular user. We can certify access based on any template. Uh, we can disable a set of accounts if you go ahead and pick uh, the set of accounts that you want disabled. And then we gave a little bit more of a custom uh, way of just execute a rule or workflow, which basically means the configurer of, or the integrator can do anything they would like since rules and workflows have that infinite flexibility. The next piece that you have to pick is your risk type. So it's either your closed session, which just means that we're gonna check your risk at the end of your session. We can look at your current risk. We can look at your risk over 30 days. I think risk over seven days is the other option. And then you have to just provide the min and the max score, which allows you to have, you could have 10 of these that say, if your risk is between zero and 100, do a notification, 100 and 200, do a certification, et cetera. And you can have all of these different thresholds that establish different actions. Um, Matt, I'm gonna pause you real quick. So for everybody, all the uh, attendees here, um, we've got about five minutes left. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to throw them in chat, um, whether it's user behavior analytics, sale point related, um, any identity issues you might be having on your current programs, um, more than happy to chat through and work through any of those. So uh, please drop them in and uh, we'll get back to them in a few. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Yep. So in the end, we have a way to get from a risk act or a risk, elevated risk directly to a response. So here we have the risk going up to 120. And on the right, we have a certification that's immediately kicked off to the manager. And this, this provides that immediate feedback of your user is doing this. Your, the, the user has had their risk score increased. Now we would like you to be directly involved and certify that this user should continue to have this access. If it keeps going up, we could go ahead and disable it completely. But here is a good checkpoint for the manager to be involved in what their user is actually doing with the risk instead of waiting until the SOC analyst has to run an SOP because the risk has gotten so high. So in summary, um, we provide the UAVA user context that is not available in the SIM down to SailPoint. So we give some context both to SailPoint and to the SOC analysts. We also start to automate some of those SOAR actions using SailPoint instead of those bash scripts. We also incorporate the manager in these processes. So we start giving the manager visibility into what their user is doing. And in the end, inside of the UAVA product, we have a 360 view of what the user is doing with that access. And then as a reminder, in September 16th, our next web series that's coming up is on just-in-time provisioning. So please stay tuned for that. And then we'll open it up for questions as Matt had said. Cool, so thank you, Matt. Um, that's always a great overview, I know we uh, blew through this pretty quick today. Um, there's a lot of content there and a lot of options as to what can be done um, by combining these two worlds together. Um, I know we've rolled this out with some customers already. Um, what do you think is um, kind of the biggest early on value that our customers have seen um, just starting to bring this together? Um, I would say some of the early on value is the, the SOC analyst being able to immediately have that feedback as far as how the user got to an endpoint. They currently, like I said before, kind of going through all of the server logs. They have to open up sometimes 10 different logs just to see how a user that logged in got to the end state that they are. Instead of having this timeline that's immediately available that provides the second resolution of how they got there all in one place is immediately beneficial. It reduces the time to, to threat hunting and also threat investigation. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, 
and some of the customers that have an end user behavior as well when they it's it's amazing to me that a lot of these customers who are on the SOC side of the world, more of that real-time network security side, don't have access to the BI tools to be able to even understand the data or the u data about the users they're looking at. And by giving them some of that reporting access you showed in the sale point when they go, oh, wow, like I know when this person started, I know what department they're in, I know how long they've been here. Uh, I know how close to their peers they look like or, oh, that's, I now understand that because that person used to work in this group. Now they work in this group. They just made a job change in the last month. They are doing two jobs right now. So they look weird, but that's okay. And just some of those responses that they've had, just being able to finally see that data has been, at least for me, some of the fun realizations um, we've had with some of these customers. Um, I guess, Matt, what has been um, some of the biggest challenges we've seen? Um, biggest challenges? Um, Other we, than the technical implementation of yeah. gluing these products together um, <laughs> in the beginning. That, that, is, that is what I was going to get into. <laughs> Um, big challenges are these these teams, uh, the SOC analysts and the identity teams aren't all, aren't always uh, peers, even though we should be. So there's a, a business part of this where incorporating those two teams and getting them to start working together and sharing the information be between them, the organizations are not always set up to support that. Yeah, and um, I think as we've seen that go back to some of the business side as well when we're talking about bringing these teams together and user behavior analytics tools in general both teams the identity teams and the SOC teams see incredible value in doing this um and really for me at least in my role with uber has been um really helping them sell the value up to their management and the leadership as to this is the type of behaviors that we're going to be able to see. And by the way, this is also ways that will help us accelerate, not over only give us new ways to protect ourselves, but actually accelerate some of the business and reduce some of the false positives and um, also delegate some of that shared responsibility for security across the organization, which we all know um, many organizations we work with struggle with um, security while should be everyone's job a lot of times is seen as the technical guy's problem um but giving this visibility back to the business has been pretty awesome to see as well so um other than that i haven't seen any additional questions come in so um thank you matt and we will turn it back over to katie All right, thank you, Matt and Matt, for being here with us today. We hope the information everybody received during today's webinar has been helpful for both you and your organization. As a reminder, we, everyone will receive a recording of the presentation and a follow-up email. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to call or email us. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.